Well friends, it is a pleasure to be able to bring the Lord's Word to you, to my friends there at Wooden Valley, and uh, pray much for you at this time that you would know the Lord's blessing and comfort. It is strange circumstances in which we meet, and it, it is a shame that we cannot meet together face to face and, and share fellowship one with another, but we do trust the Lord to help us to overcome these difficulties and to bless us still. It is a wonderful encouragement to know that our Lord is able to work to bless each one of us, though we be at such a distance. Well, before we come to consider God's word together, please turn with me again in prayer. Let us pray. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, our gracious and merciful God, O Lord, it is our delight and privilege to look unto thee in all things. And Lord, we do thank thee that we have this technology to be able still to worship together. We wonder where we would be without it. And O oh Lord, we do pray then that as we come around thy word now, Lord, that thou wouldst give us great help. O oh Lord, do uh, give us help to overcome the awkwardness, O oh Lord, both for preacher and hearer there at home. O oh Lord, we do pray that thou wouldst pour out thy blessing upon us. Uh, may we know, O oh Lord, uh, thy voice coming to us through thy word. O oh Lord, we pray, give us help now then. Help us as we come to thy holy scriptures. O oh Lord, do teach us wonderful things from thy word. We do love thy word. O oh Lord, bless it to us tonight. May we hear thy wonderful voice. Uh, give us a comfort, O oh Lord, we pray. Give us a time now together uh, to come aside and rest a while. To rest into thy presence, O oh Lord. To rest uh, in thy wonderful word. Lord, please uh, speak a word in season to the weary, uh, to the sad of heart. O oh Lord, do lift us all up to great praise and adoration of our high and holy God. May all things, O oh Lord, then uh, be to thy glory. Be to thy praise and to thine honour, and the good of thy people. Bless us now then, Lord, forgive our every sin, for we do ask it in the name of our dear Saviour, even the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, friends, please turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 139, the 139th Psalm. And our text for this evening is found in verses 17 and 18. Psalm 139, verses 17 and 18. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. And as we come to this psalm this evening, we see that here in this psalm, David is... Uh, giving expression to his awe and adoration of God's omniscience and omnipresence. And by that we mean uh, God's all knowledge, his omniscience, omni meaning all and science meaning knowledge, his all knowledge of all things and all people. And of course his omnipresence too, that the Lord is everywhere, seeing all things, knowing all that takes place. We see from the title of this psalm that it is indeed a psalm of David. And we see also that it is to the chief musician. It is to be given uh, to the leader of uh, the temple psalmody, to be put to music and to be sung in solemn worship of God. Perhaps then this title should uh, give us a greater sense of the importance of this psalm. And the notability of it. Well, as we said, David is here impressed with the omniscience of his God. He says, the Lord has searched me and known me. He knows my down-sitting and uprising. He compasses my path. He has beset me behind and before. And what is important to note from this psalm is that not only does David worship God for his omniscience, not only does he recognise the doctrine, but he applies it personally. David doesn't begin by saying, the Lord has searched all people and known them. No, David says, 
Thou, Lord, hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my downsitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. There is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. So he takes the doctrine and he applies it to himself. He says, The Lord, Lord, thou hast known me, known me perfectly, known my heart, known my thoughts, known my words. And David then moves on to consider the Lord's omnipresence. He says in verse 7, Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. So there was nowhere he could go to escape the Lord's all-seeing eye. Nowhere he could go to flee from the presence of Almighty God. Nowhere where he could not be seen. But David then considers the Lord's making of him, fashioning of him in the womb, and how the Lord knew him even there, where other eyes could not see. There the Lord knew him. And David draws a conclusion at the end of this psalm, a conclusion of the doctrine of the Lord's omniscience for the wicked. Surely thou wilt slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, ye bloody men. You see, David sees that if God has known all, he knows everybody's hearts, he knows all that has been said and done, surely the Lord marks our iniquities. Surely the Lord will bring recompense upon sin. The warning of Scripture is clear, friends. Numbers 32, 23 says, Ye have sinned against the Lord, and be sure... Your sin will find you out. So for the unbeliever, uh, God's omniscience must be a fearful thing. The Lord knows our hearts. He knows our sins. But for the believer, there is comfort to be had in this. The Lord knows us, knows us intimately, knows us better than we know ourselves. And David is able to find comfort in the Lord's knowledge of him. And in our text this evening, David seems to overflow with praise unto God. He seems to break off in adoration. And he says, how precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. Friends, we do live in troubling days. Perhaps there is much that frightens us. Perhaps there is much that uh, confuses us and causes our souls to be cast down. In the midst of the storms of this life, whatever they may be, I hope and pray that we can take shelter under these words this evening, as we consider the Lord's thoughts of us, may we be able to, to rest a while in this most heavenly doctrine. And as we consider these words, uh, we see that there are three things that arise here. Firstly, we see that God's thoughts are precious. How precious also are thy thoughts. Secondly, we'll see that God's thoughts are personal. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God. And thirdly, God's thoughts are plentiful. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. God's thoughts towards his people, they are precious. They are personal and they are plentiful. Firstly then we see that God's thoughts are precious. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God. David here attributes great value to the thoughts of God towards him. 
They are precious to him. It is a valuable thing to the psalmist that God should think of him. He counts it dear to him. The Lord Almighty should consider him. And for the believer, God's thoughts are precious to us indeed. They are of more value to us than all the gold in the world. To know that we constantly occupy a place in the heart of the eternal God, a place in his thoughts. It is a wonderful thing indeed. And well, we should say with the psalmist, how precious are thy thoughts unto me. We do know, each one of us I'm sure knows the, the comfort of someone thinking of us. If we get a message, perhaps out of the blue, from someone we know, and, and they just share with us that they are thinking of us, that they are praying for us, how much that can uplift our hearts, how much it can uplift our souls. A short while ago, Jenny had to return to work after her maternity leave, and a dear couple in the church, they thought of us, prepared a meal for us, and brought it round. And that moved us deeply, that they should think of us, that they should think of our circumstances and our situation and desire to help. But oh, how much more precious it should be, friends, that the Lord thinks on us, that the Lord God Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, should give his attention to us. That we are on the mind and heart of the eternal, all-powerful God. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me. But let us consider uh, for a brief time now, what is it that makes these thoughts of God so precious? Well, firstly, we notice that uh, God's thoughts of us are precious because they are so undeserved. Who are we that the Lord should think on us? Who are we? We are so stained with sin. We who are but the dust of the earth. What is man that thou art mindful of him? What a great mercy it is that the Lord should consider us. He is the Holy One of Israel, the perfectly righteous God. There is none to rival him. And yet he has regard to the lowly. Yet he has respect to us. Yet he condescends to think on us. We who deserve nothing but eternal punishment for our sins. And yet the Lord God, our Heavenly Father, is pleased to think of us. So take heart, dear believer, this evening. Though you may be so unworthy, yet the King of Kings thinks of you. Secondly, we note that God's thoughts of his people, they are so precious because of the content of those thoughts. God's thoughts are towards his people, but, but what does he think concerning them? Are they hard thoughts? Are they grievous thoughts? Oh no, friends, they are thoughts of peace, thoughts of love, thoughts of care and concern. We hear the Lord's own words in Jeremiah 29 and verse 11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil. To give you an expected end. We find in the heart of God thoughts of peace towards his people. By Christ's shed blood upon the cross, we who believe have been reconciled unto God. We who before were the children of wrath, yet we are brought near to the Lord. And now there is peace. And before uh, we made 
the Lord angry with our sins. Before we were a smoke in his nostrils, yet now the Lord's thoughts towards us are thoughts of peace. I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil. Thoughts of promoting and sustaining that peace. Thoughts of keeping us in his perfect promised peace. And this is why, friends, our Lord has given us so many precious promises in his scripture. Promises that promote peace. Promises that banish fear and trouble of heart. Let not your heart be troubled. God is at peace with you. His thoughts towards you are thoughts of peace. His thoughts of us also are thoughts of love. Jeremiah 31 and verse 3. The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore with loving kindness have I drawn thee. You see, each believer is so dear in the sight of God. We as the Lord's people are the apple of his eye and his thoughts towards us overflow with divine love, perfect love. And how wonderfully, friends, he evidenced his love towards us in giving his own dear son to the cross. If ever you doubt the love of God towards you, Oh, go to Calvary. See how he gave his only begotten son, that you may be at peace with God, that your sins should be dealt with, that justice should be met, and mercy extended to you. See how he gave his son to pay the punishment that you deserve. Such love. In this was manifested the love of God towards us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we through him might live. Friends, if you search the thoughts of God this evening, you would find such sweet thoughts of love towards you. The Lord loves his people. They're precious to him. They are his jewels. And not one of his thoughts towards us is harsh and unloving. He has shown love to the unlovable. How precious are thy thoughts unto me. A monument of grace, a sinner saved by blood. The streams of love I trace up to the fountain, God. And in his sovereign counsel see eternal thoughts of love to me. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Friends, do we not love him for his love to us? Do we, do we not reciprocate such love unto our God? We love him because he first loved us. Well, further we see that his thoughts towards us, they are thoughts of peace, they are thoughts of love, but they are also thoughts full of care and concern for his people. Never have we found our God to be indifferent to our trials. Never have we found him to be unmoved by our complaint, because he cares for us. We are his children, and our Heavenly Father, he pours out his care upon us. Peter 5 and verse 7, 1 Peter 5 verse 7 says, Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Dear believer, he cares for you. Your Heavenly Father cares for you. I heard someone comment on this verse recently, and, and he said that it could well be rendered... It matters to him concerning you. It matters to him concerning you. The Lord is 
so cares for your plight. He cares for your soul. That all that you face this day, it matters to him. It matters to him how you feel. It matters to him how you are coping. He cares for your soul. He cares about upholding you through the trials of life. When the going gets tough, he's there to take you up into his arms and to carry you through. He cares and he has placed underneath those everlasting arms. He provides that perfect safety net because his thoughts towards you are thoughts of care, thoughts of love and thoughts of peace. And because he cares, friends, he thinks of our needs and he considers the provision that he will supply. Our Lord said, didn't he, take no thought, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things to the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. Your Father knoweth your need. Dear believer, your heavenly Father knows your every need. And how does he know? Because he thinks on you. Because you're ever before him. Because his attention is towards you. And he knows. He knows your heart. He knows your life. He has searched you and known you. And he cares for you beyond measure. Our God's thoughts of us are thoughts of our happiness. He desires us to know and experience the joy of our salvation. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, rejoice. And who are they in this world who are truly happy? Lastingly happy. Is it those who have the most riches? Is it those who are surrounded by the most friends? Is it those who have the highest positions in society? No, friends, the happy are they who know the Lord. Psalm 144 verse 15 says, Happy is that people that is in such a case. Yea, happy is that people whose God is the Lord. Our Lord thinks of our happiness, both in time and eternity to come, where he has prepared a place for us, a place that will be so suited to give us the greatest happiness, to give us the greatest joy. Oh, friends, let your joy be full in the Lord this evening, in the Lord who thinks upon you. Notice further that our Lord thinks of our spiritual well-being. From eternity, he thought of our pardon and forgiveness, our renewal and sanctification. We are the clay and he is the potter and he moulds us according to his will. He shapes us each and every day. He is at work in our lives to sanctify us more and more, to draw out of us those fruits that he has planted there. He will perfect that which concerns us because he thinks of our spiritual well-being. He thinks of us. He thinks to keep us in his way. To keep our feet from falling. It's like a father who's watching his child, child who's just learning to walk, taking those first nervous steps and the child is wobbly, but the father's there, ever vigilant, waiting with open arms to catch the child should he begin to fall. And our heavenly father, he, he thinks upon our spiritual well-being. And as we teeter and totter like that child, our father is there with his arms, outstretched, ready to catch us should we fall, lest we bring great harm to ourselves. Further, friends, his thoughts are precious to us because they turn to action 
His thoughts are his purposes. And this word thoughts that we have in our text, it could be translated purposes or aims. Often we see through the Psalms that God's works and God's thoughts are mentioned together. Psalm 40 and verse 5 says, Many, O Lord my God, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done, and thy thoughts which are to usward. Psalm 92 and verse 5, O Lord, how great are thy works, and thy thoughts are very deep. Friends, how often do we have good intentions? We have good thoughts, good ideas of things we should do. But how often do we forget to do them? How often do they not materialise? Those good intentions never become good actions. But it is not so with the Lord. His good intentions always come to fruition. His thoughts turn to his actions and his wonderful works. And so when he thinks of our good, he works towards our good. When he thinks of blessing us, he showers us with his mercies. Because his thoughts turn to his works. His thoughts towards us are also precious because they evidence his commitment towards his people. He has made a covenant with his people to be their God. And he will not forsake that covenant. He will not forsake his people. He will never leave them. Never forsake them. Never give them up. Never will he take his eye from off of them. Never will he cease to give them his attention. Never will he stop to think of them. His thoughts of us are precious uh, because they are not like our thoughts. Isaiah 55 and verse 8 reads, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Friends, often I feel that we can be so guilty of humanising God. We expect him to think as we might think, to respond as a man might respond. But we thank God his thoughts are higher than ours. His thoughts are far higher than ours ever could be. His thoughts are not stained with sin. His thoughts are not selfish and full of pride. God's thoughts are far higher than man's. For he is God and not man. Hosea 11.9 Friends, are not then the thoughts of God precious to us? Do they not fill us with comfort, with awe and with joy? Here we can comfortably rest upon the precious thoughts of our God. How precious are thy thoughts? Well, secondly, we see, friends, that not only are they precious, but they are personal. David says, how precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God. They are precious to me. Precious to me because God thinks on me personally. David says, in Psalm 40 and verse 17, I am poor and needy, yet the Lord thinketh upon me. The Lord thinketh on me. And each believer may say that this evening. The Lord, he thinks on me. His thoughts are personal to me. Poor and needy though I am. Weak and sinful though I may be, yet he thinks of me. Yet I ever have the full attention of my loving Heavenly Father. In this psalm, David has been considering God's omniscience. And the Lord knows all about us. He knows our hearts. He knows our secret sins. The things that we would be so, so ashamed if others knew. 
He knows those thoughts and desires of our hearts that are evil. He knows all. And in spite of this, the Lord thinketh upon me. In spite of this, the Lord is pleased to have such kind thoughts towards me. If a, another man knew all of my heart, if another knew everything that I think, oh, he would not think on me. He would turn his back on me. He would be ashamed to look at me. But the Lord knows all. He knows us better than we know ourselves. And in spite of what he sees, the Lord thinks upon us with thoughts of peace and thoughts of love. How precious are thy thoughts unto me, O God. Consider, friends, how important this makes each believer. That the Lord God Almighty constantly, perpetually thinks of you. What an honour, what a privilege that bestows upon you. What a position that puts you in, friends. How important are the Lord's people that the Lord should think on them. Perpetually, eternally, with innumerable thoughts. And friends, I don't know your situations. But perhaps there are some hearing me this evening who live alone. And perhaps this time of lockdown has been so tough on you. Perhaps you are suffering greatly with a sense of loneliness. And perhaps you, you fear that people have forgotten you. But friend, take comfort this evening. The Lord has not forgotten you. His thoughts towards you are innumerable and eternal and personal. He does not forget you. Isaiah 49, 15 says, Can a woman forget her sucking child, that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget, yet will I not forget thee. Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Yet will I not forget thee. Dear child of God, it's impossible that the Lord should forget you. Your name is engraven on his hands. And that shows us that we are ever before him. And that when his hands move to work, he works with us in mind. It is impossible that he should forget you. You are always in his thoughts. And David didn't say, I am poor and needy, yet the Lord thinks on his people. No, he said, I am poor and needy, yet the Lord thinks on me. It is personal. The Lord thinks on me. And friends, he thinks of us at whatever state we are in. And whether we are prospering spiritually, or whether we are backslidden, and far from God, yet still his thoughts remain toward us. And there are times when we feel ourselves to be far from God. We feel that we have lost that connection with our Heavenly Father. And this is how the psalmist felt when he said, In my haste I said, I am cut off from before thine eyes. And when we are in such a state, we can begin to have doubts of God. Psalm 77 and verse 9, Hath God forgotten to be gracious? Hath he in his anger shut up his tender mercies? Oh my friend, if you are in such a state this evening, if you feel cut off from God, if you feel even that you perhaps are beginning to doubt his care of you, do not fret. Do not doubt your God. He still thinks of you. He hasn't taken his eye off of you. You haven't been removed from his attention. His thoughts are still towards you. And if you are in the midst of trials and your heart is perplexed and troubled, the Lord's thoughts are as much 
over you as ever they have been. We have a God who remembered us in our lowest state, for his mercy endureth forever. Psalm 136, verse 23. And so, friend, whatever state you find yourself in this evening, be assured you have not fallen from the thoughts of God. He still thinks of you. Well, we have seen then that the thoughts of God are precious. We've seen that they are personal. But thirdly, and finally, we see, friends, that they are plentiful. They are plentiful. David says, How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. Perhaps if there are young people listening, uh, imagine going to your local beach. Imagine taking up a handful of sand and now try and guess how many grains you will have in your hand. What an impossible task. Surely it is thousands, even in one handful. But now think of every stretch of sand on every beach, seashore in this world, think of every grain of sand in every desert. How many are there? Oh, they are innumerable, past knowing. So many are the grains of sand. It could not be possible to count them. I heard of one at a university several years ago who thought they would try to count the grains of sand on a beach in Cornwall. And they reckoned it would take them five years to count them. Just on that one beach, five years, with all their equipment, with all their scientific know-how, five years it would take. Now imagine every grain of sand in all the world. Oh, it is past counting. And David says here that God's thoughts of him are more in number than the sand. And this is not an exaggeration, friends, on the part of the psalmist. No, no, not at all. Spurgeon said of this verse, this is not hyperbole of poetry, but the solid fact of inspired statement. God thinks upon us infinitely. Oh, dear believer, try and get a grasp upon this precious truth that the thoughts of God for you are infinite. They are more in number than the sand. It seems, doesn't it, like an understatement for David to say, how great is the sum of them. How great is the sum of them. Many, O Lord, my God, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done, and thy thoughts which are to usward, they cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. God's thoughts of us, they are infinite. They are eternal. They are innumerable. There is never a moment when the Lord is not thinking of you, Believer, the Lord's thoughts of you are eternal, uh, that is, they are not bound by time. In eternity past, the Lord thought of you, before you were made, before ever even the world was formed, the Lord God thought of you. He set his love upon you. He elected you to be a recipient of his grace. In eternity past, he betrothed you to his Son, that you should be given to him, redeemed by him, that he should be your head and your representative, your Saviour. And in eternity past, 
the Lord Jesus Christ promised to undertake to save you. He promised to enter this world in time, to go to the cross and there to bear the wrath of God that you may be saved. All of this before ever the world was made. He thought of you in eternity past. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. He thought of you from eternity to predestinate you to be saved. What does that word mean, predestinate? Well, the best definition I've heard is to make firm beforehand. To predestinate something is to make it firm beforehand. And so for each of the Lord's elect, he made it firm beforehand that they should be saved, that they should be redeemed, that they should receive grace in Jesus Christ. No saving mercy and become the children of God. And dear believer, that is what he has done for you. He thought of you in eternity past to make it firm beforehand that you should receive saving grace, that you should become a child of God. And then, friends, he thought of you in time when he gave his only begotten son to the cross, when Christ was subject to such cruel mockery, when he faced such unjust trials. When he was scourged and beaten and spat upon. When he was led out of the city and lifted up to die. When those nails pierced his hands and his feet. When he cried, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Then he thought upon you. He said, didn't he, this is my body broken for you. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. He thought of me before ever I was born. He undertook to, to die for me before ever I was made. Centuries before I appeared on this earth, he shed his blood for me. How precious are thy thoughts unto me, O God! How great is the sum of them! And dear believer, do you know that Christ prayed for you in that garden of Gethsemane. There in that garden, hours before his betrayal and before his crucifixion, he prayed of you. He expressed his thoughts toward you. John 17 and verse 20. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. The Lord Jesus Christ, he was aware of you when on this earth, thinking of you. He knew those for whom he would die. He knew those who would receive salvation by his shed blood. He said once, other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice. There shall be one fold and one shepherd. The Lord knew those that were to be saved. He knew that there were others to come, others that he was yet to call, others who would be brought into his fold. And in that garden of Gethsemane, he showed his desire towards each believer when he prayed, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am. 
that they may behold my glory. He prayed, Father, that those whom thou hast given to me from eternity past, even those who are yet to be saved, down further down the corridors of time, I will that all of them should be with me where I am, that they should be in glory with me, Father, that they should behold my glory, enjoy my presence forevermore, and worship me. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am. And the Lord, he thought of you in eternity past. He thought of you, dear believer, when he gave his son for you. But he thought of you also at your conception, at the earliest point of your existence. There was the Lord watching over you, thinking of you, when as yet others didn't even know of your existence. Yet the Lord saw you and thought of you. This is what David has been marvelling at in this psalm. He says in verse 13, Thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvellous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. Oh, if only, if only those who sadly support abortion would only read and understand this psalm, how that the Lord knows us intimately when we were in the womb. At our earliest point of existence, the Lord saw us, and knew us, and thought of us. We can only gaze, can't we, upon a child in the womb through an ultrasound scan. And, and those of you who are parents, you may treasure those pictures, those shady, obscure, blurry outlines of your child in the womb. That is the best view we have. But the Lord, he sees. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And when we were in the womb, friends, our Lord, he thought of us. When we couldn't yet think for ourselves, the Lord thought of us. He considered us, his attention was upon us, his care was over us, he knew us. And as we grew, the Lord's thoughts were ever over us. And even though we were as yet unsaved, the Lord still attended to us. He, he pursued us down our course of sin. And when we refused to think of him, when we rejected his gospel and lived with no regard for him, even then he thought of us. Even then his love was set firmly upon us. Even then it was his purpose to call us to himself. Here in his love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. While we were so unaware of him, he was there ordering providence that we should hear the gospel, that we should be brought under a faithful ministry, that we should turn to his word. He even fenced us in in our rebellion, not letting us rove beyond the limits he set. And then he thought of us when the time of conversion came, when he decreed that there was time, when the Lord commanded his spirit to arrest us, to convict us of sin and to lead us to Christ, when he called us effectually by the power of his Holy Spirit, 
when he gave us those gifts of repentance and faith, and when we cried out to him for mercy, the Lord was thinking on us all the while. And every day since that blessed day, our Lord has thought of us and continues to do so. He thinks of us on the extraordinary days, days of notable providence, days when uh, notable things happen in our lives. Maybe we, we marry or we have children or get that new job or are led to move to that new place. On those days the Lord is there and he thinks of us. But even on the ordinary days, all the days in between, the Lord's thoughts are ever upon us. And in eternity to come, the Lamb of God, he will lead us. He will be there to give us an abundant entrance into his kingdom. He will receive us to himself. He will wipe away our every tear. And we shall be with him for all eternity. Beholding his glory and praising him. Ever does our Lord think upon us. His thoughts, they are plentiful. They are eternal. They are innumerable. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. And one conclusion we can draw from this, friends, is that the Lord thinks on us far more than we think of him. If you are a believer, then uh, there is not a day that goes by when you do not think upon the Lord. Although we do confess readily that we don't think of him as often as we should, yet there is never a day where we do not think of him. But even then, our Lord's thoughts of us far outweigh our thoughts of him. While we sleep, perhaps, our thoughts quieten and lessen. But when we, find, we find when we awake that we are still with the Lord. His thoughts haven't left us. His attentions haven't deviated for a moment. His care is never being diverted. Our Lord thinks of us with innumerable thoughts. Well, friends, as we draw to a close, what a comforting text this is. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. There are times when a preacher cannot help but feel he has not done justice to his subject. And friends, I can't help but feel that, oh, if I could cause you to see the wonderful thoughts of God towards you, dear believer. Oh, how that should uplift your heart. How that should cause you to rejoice in him. I say again, our Lord thinks of you with precious, personal and plentiful thoughts. Oh, let that rejoice your heart, dear friends. It is my earnest prayer that the Lord would comfort you with these things, as I trust he has comforted me. But as we close, friends, if the Lord has set such love upon us, if he has been so faithful to us all the while, lavished us with such precious thoughts of us and care and concern for us, is it not a small thing that we should give him our hearts, that we should give him more of our thoughts, more of our attention day by day, more of our desires and our purposes each day, Oh, may we be more consecrated unto him. May we meditate upon him. Perhaps uh, this time of lockdown has given us more of a chance to do just that. 
Use the time you've got, friends. Meditate upon him more. Direct your thoughts towards him more. And worship him. Seek him by prayer. Seek him through the, the constant reading of his word. And if you're listening tonight, but you do not as yet know the Lord, you are a stranger to his grace. Oh, may I commend him to you. It is said of the ungodly that the Lord is not in all his thoughts. And perhaps it is so with you. Perhaps you refuse to think upon the Lord. It makes you uncomfortable to consider him. You don't want to give your thoughts to him. Friends, when you begin to think of him tonight, when you begin to think of him, the only one who can save you, when you begin to think of him, the saviour of the world, the one who gave his only begotten son, that he might offer you mercy, when you begin to think of the God who prefers mercy, the God who would not see you perish, but would rather you repent, Will you not begin to think of the God who has said, Come unto me? Well, think on him, friends. Think on the Lord Jesus Christ. Think on the one who offers you pardon even this night. Turn to him. Cry unto him for forgiveness. And then rejoice forevermore in his precious thoughts of you. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. Let us close, friends, with prayer. Let us turn to the Lord in prayer. O Heavenly Father, Lord, we confess we struggle to find adequate words to express our thanks unto Thee for all of Thy many and precious thoughts towards us. Oh, we thank Thee, Lord, that ever Thine eye is upon us and that we find in the heart of eternal God such mercy, such peace and love towards us. Oh, Father, may each one here listening this evening be given to understand, to grasp uh, something of thy thoughts towards them. Oh Lord, please comfort each dear believer with these wonderful words. Comfort, oh Lord, each soul with the wonderful knowledge that God thinks of them. Oh Father, give us a season this evening of, of drawing into thy presence. Oh Lord, of, of resting a while with thee upon these wonderful truths. Oh, Father, help our hearts to respond to Thee with praise and adoration. And Lord, if there are any who do yet not know Thee, oh, Father God, may they begin to think on Thee tonight. Lord, do work in their hearts that they would uh, seek Thee, that they would be inclined unto Thee, though maybe the, all their lives they have been content to neglect thee, to forsake thee, to push thee away. Yet, Lord, work in their hearts that tonight they may begin to think on thee, begin to think upon thy wonderful gospel and thy offer of salvation. And save sinners, O oh Lord, we pray. O oh, Father God, bless us then now. Forgive our many sins and do comfort us, Lord, with this wonderful portion of thy scripture. We rejoice to know that even now we come unto the God who is thinking of us, ever mindful of us. Lord, we thank thee for thy love. We can never deserve it. Help us to praise thee as thou art worthy of, O Lord. For we ask it all in Jesus' precious name. Amen.